All right, just before I get, because I'm still on the topic of hell this morning, um, just continuing on from the topic when I was preaching a couple of weeks ago before we had um, Kevin bring us two sermons on end times. Um, But before I get into the topic that I wanted to talk about today, uh, which is the soul that has never heard the gospel, I just wanted to bring up two points about Jesus Christ in hell. Because if you remember, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a sermon on seven reasons why Jesus Christ went to hell and why it was necessary for our salvation. Because if hell is the punishment for our sin, Jesus Christ would have had to go there in order to, to satisfy that punishment for justice to be done. And I just wanted to give you two other reasons because I thought these were too good to not share with you. Um, but I, first of all, I just wanted to show you Psalm 88. And we just, um, we'll just, I'll read this for you. And I just wanted you to, think, you to think of Jonah 2 at the same time as we read through this. And I really do believe that Psalm 88 is talking about uh, Jesus Christ going to hell and, and him expressing uh, his thoughts there. Um, so l- listen to this psalm. O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a, as a man that hath no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that, are, that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hands. Doesn't that sound like hell? Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness and in deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and, thy, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Silah. Doesn't that right? remind you of Jonah too? Thou hast put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot go forth. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee, Salah? Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction? Anyway, when I think of that verse, I, was, uh, I can't remember who I was talking to about it, but you know about the... The Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison and was saying a thought might be because he did go there and preach the word of God because he said a lot of these psalms probably when he was down there uh, and that's just one uh, maybe a thought on how he preached to the, to the people that were in hell when he was down there so he's saying shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave or thy faithfulness in destruction shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why why hidest thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They came round about me daily like water. They compassed me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. So obviously we can't build a doctrine off it. I just think it's interesting we compare that to Jonah 2 and a lot of the points that I brought up in that sermon. Um, it's just interesting that it's almost like he's cry- this, this, David is, is preaching and he's crying from, from hell, the lowest pit, and talking about the wrath and terrors uh, on him from God. The other one as well that I missed, and, and this is a, I think a really good one too, is in Ephesians 5. The Bible says here in Ephesians 5, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. And I already mentioned in that sermon that, you know, his soul was made an offering for sin, and the Passover lamb uh, being that picture where he was burnt. But here it says here that Christ hath given himself an offering, and then it uses this phrase, a sacrifice to God, for a sweet smelling savor. Now in the Old Testament, we don't see it as a sweet smelling savor. It actually uh, is a, uh, an odor of a sweet savor. Um, but I just want to show you an example because every time uh, in the Old Testament it talks about this sweet smelling savor, it is a burnt sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that is offered by fire. And I'll just show you uh, an example here in Exodus 29:18. Here, and thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if you just search in your, in, you know, your Bible software and just search sweet savor, again, all through Leviticus as well, uh, it just keeps repeating this phrase. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire 
unto the Lord. And Jesus Christ was the offering and he was a sweet smelling savour. So it's just another uh, interesting um, point there on Jesus Christ having to suffer in hell for our sins to satisfy that punishment. Now, but what I wanted to talk about today uh, was the question, you know, what about the soul that has never heard the gospel? And, and this is a, often a question that comes up. It's often raised as an accusation against God. And I just want you to, I just want to go through the logic with you of how people come to this question. Because the logic goes like this. Number one, God's punishment for sin is hell, right? Romans uh, 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So God has a punishment for sin, and that is eternity in hell. Number two, we sin from birth as well as willfully sinning, don't we? So Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God's punishment for sin is hell, and we all sin from birth, and we all willfully sin. So we all deserve that punishment. Then we learned, uh, I can't remember how many weeks ago, but when we talked about how babies went to heaven, we, we learned that everyone, even though a baby who is spiritually alive, but their sin is dead, eventually we'll come to that knowledge, right? So we're, we're, discount, we're not talking about the babies that die and go to heaven. We're talking about everyone eventually who has sinned and deserves hell will come to that knowledge, right? And because they've already sinned, they will die the moment they understand sin and salvation. <clears throat> so number four is, therefore, and we came to this conclusion, we go to hell, a person goes to hell not because they have sinned, because we all sin and eventually they come to that knowledge and now they're condemned. They go to hell because they do not accept the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what sends them to hell. The grace is available to them. At the point they understand sin, they understand salvation, and if they don't accept salvation, they'll go to hell. But then number five is, you know, but then Romans 10 says, how shall they hear without a preacher? So then the question is then asked, well then, if somebody never has the opportunity to even know about Jesus Christ, how can God justly send that person to hell if they never even had the opportunity to, to believe on him? And that's where the question comes from. So that's the reasoning behind how we even come to that question. So it's not sin that sends us to hell. It's not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But how shall they hear without a preacher, Romans 10 says. So how can God send somebody to hell who does not even have the opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ? Now, one thought I have before going into to, to the points I have today, is do, does this person only exist in the hypothetical? Meaning, can you even, can you even actually meet this person? Because how, when you see somebody and you're like, oh, there's somebody that has never heard of Jesus Christ, how would you even know that they haven't heard of Jesus Christ? The only way you could know is if you ask them. And then the moment you ask them, now they've heard of Jesus Christ. So... You know, it, d does this person only exist in the hypothetical? Possibly, but I, may, I, can, I can give it that, you know, there probably are people out there that I guess, you know, because we, we, we don't know that they haven't and we don't know that they have. But we could say that they, they only exist in the hypothetical because we, we don't know until somebody reaches them. <clears throat> now, I just want you to think as well that, the, you know, the, the you've you got to think of the intent behind the question because when somebody asks... You know, what about the people that have not heard the gospel? The intent behind the question is to accuse God of not being just, right? That, that's really uh, why it's an objection, because if, they, if, if, um, if there wasn't an issue, it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even come up. So the intent of the question is to accuse God of being unjust in his judgment uh, of not accepting Christ. You know, they'll say, how can that be the way of salvation? How can the way of salvation be to believe on Jesus Christ when not everybody has heard of Jesus Christ? You know, not everybody has heard the gospel, and if not all have, if, if not everyone has, if everyone does not have the opportunity to be saved, how can you hold the sinner accountable for his sin? How can you hold that person accountable for not accepting Jesus Christ if they have never had the choice? And and they basically will throw that accusation that that Abraham did. You know, Abraham threw the accusation to God, saying, "Will not the Judge of all the earth do right?" Now we learn from that that the judge of all the earth will do right. And we saw from that, from that story that he did do what's right. He took out Lot and he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, but remember, but, but Abraham, I think, because he asked it as a question, you know, because he, he was trying to bargain with God, right? And then he said, will not the judge of all the earth do right? So it was, it was actually an accusation and thinking, you know, how can you do this? This is not right. But we, we learned that God always does what's right. So 
this, this, is, this is the intent of the question and why it, it, it is important to answer because it, it is an accusation on the, the just uh, judgment of God which is to send those that have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to hell. Um, so, you know, and today I, I don't know if I have a definitive answer for you, you know, but I wanted to just share a couple of points and the possible scenarios and the, the, the scenario that I swing towards. So I'll just go through a couple. I've got three scenarios for you. So when it, when it comes to who is at fault, who is responsible for the person going to hell, you really only have three options, three scenarios. And number one is God is responsible. And, you know, obviously this is not a position that we believe, but this is the position of Calvinism. Calvinism is, you know, tulip, T-U-L-I-P, and the U in tulip is unconditional election. Unconditional election means that God just chooses who will believe, who will not believe, who will be saved, and who will not be saved unconditionally. For no reason at all, just for His glory, He would choose somebody to believe and others not to, and it all brings Him glory. Now, we believe this is heresy. We believe this is, this, is the, this is not the God of the Bible. God does not choose who goes to heaven and who goes to hell because if he did, that, that is unfair. Because how, how can you hold the person responsible when it wasn't even their choice? You know, it was God's choice that sent them to hell. So if God predestined them for hell for his glory, then God is ultimately responsible, right? Because how can you hold, how can, you know, how can I hold Alex responsible for a choice he can't even make? Do you know? Now, if, God, if hell is God's righteous judgment on sin, you know, or, 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 no, if hell is God's righteous judgment for those that have sinned and rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, then why is he sending people there that don't even have the ability to believe on Jesus Christ? You know what I mean? So if it's not that people, remember, because it's not that people are sent to hell because of their sin. They're sent to hell because they did not believe on Jesus Christ. So how can then God say, this is a righteous judgment. I'm doing the right thing by sending this person to hell, but yet I don't even give them the ability or the opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ. How is that a righteous judgment? How are they being punished for something they, they could not even do? And you know what? The, the God of Calvinism is a monster. Because what sort of, what sort of God creates people without even the ability to believe and accept the grace and just creates them knowing that they're going to go to hell and just creates them to go to hell. You know, what sort of God is that? So the God of Calvinism is a monster and it's not the God that I worship. This is definitely not the position I would take that God is responsible for those that go to hell. And you know what's funny? Because even somebody that believes in Calvinism does not take that view. And this is one, you know, I just wanted to mention three big contradictions I see with Calvinism. And this isn't a sermon about Calvinism. But the, th the three big contradictions of Calvinism is even a Calvinist does not accept that. Because if you say to a Calvinist, is it God that is the responsible for that person going to hell? No, they'll say, no, 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 it's their sin. Their sin is sending them to hell. But then the, the contradiction is that they can't believe on Jesus Christ. They haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And they say, well, that's why they're going to hell, because they're a sinner and they didn't believe on Jesus Christ. But then you say to them, but they can't believe on Jesus Christ because God has not even allowed them to believe on Jesus Christ. And it's almost like they, they, they can't see the, the contradiction there of, you know, the fact that this, they're trying to hold the sinner responsible for their sin. But ultimately, God is the one responsible because God is the one not even allowing them to believe. So that, I think, is one big contradiction. And I, I find as well... You know, when I talk to a lot of people that believe in Calvinism, and you probably experience this too when you speak to people that believe in Calvinism, that generally they, they, they recognize this contradiction, which is God chose them to go to hell, and logically he then is responsible. But then they still want to hold to the position that the man is a sinner, and it's their own sin and their rejection of Jesus Christ that is sending them to hell. And, and obviously that contradicts. But then when they try and resolve these two contradictions... Their, their, I guess what, what I would call a cop-out answer is, well, you know, we just don't have the wisdom of God. God's ways are higher than my ways. And, I, and we, we just can't understand everything about God. And we just have to accept that this is something that we'll never understand. And, you know, that, that might sound right, like spiritual. You know, that might sound pious. But, you know, 
you know, they sort of say, like, who, we, we are mere humans. Who are we to question God's judgment? Who, you know, like the potter and the clay. If he's made somebody to dishonor, like, hey, that's, that's God. You know, who am I to even question what he's doing? So to me, that's a cop-out answer because, you know, my response to that is, well, or you could just change. You could just change and reject Calvinism and Calvinism is wrong and you wouldn't have that contradiction anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's like when people take James 2 and they say, oh, you know, see your works and that's how you know you're saved. And, and you're like, well, what about Romans 4 when it says to him that worketh not? And they're like, well, I, I don't know how to reconcile these two. Well, you reconcile them by rejecting your understanding of James 2 and realizing that James 2 is your works in the eyes of men and Romans 4 is your works in the eyes of God, which does not justify you. And then you have a reconciliation and then you don't have a false view. And it's like that with Calvinism. You know, there's a contradiction there. That's, that's showing you that you've got the wrong position. And something needs to change to harmonize that scripture so you have sound doctrine. So that's one big contradiction with Calvinism. But number two, uh, let me show you a couple of verses here in Ezekiel 33. <coughs> Ezekiel 33. Is that the verse I want to go to? Yeah, so I'll read you a couple of verses. Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So God is saying here, he doesn't have any pleasure in the wicked. And obviously in the old covenant, you had to turn from your sin to get that physical uh, reprieve from God. And the spiritual significance in the New Testament is we turn from our evil way by believing on Jesus Christ, uh, not by turning from our sins, because that is works. So this is an Old Testament passage I just wanted to show you to show that you know, God is saying here, I don't have pleasure in the wicked, I, I, pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't, he, he's not willing that any should perish, uh, but that all should come to repentance. And we'll see that in 2 Peter 3. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Bible is very clear. Is it, it's never God's will just to create people, to send them to hell. God created them to bless them. He wants them to be with him. He's not willing that any should perish. But unfortunately, people reject the grace of God. They don't want God. They don't want God's gift of eternal life. And they are responsible for um, rejecting that gift. So, you know, I won't turn to Revelation. But we know in Revelation it says, Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now, this is the second big contradiction I see in Calvinism, is if God is the one deciding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, why is he contradicting his own will? Do you know what I mean? If God is saying, I don't want anyone to go to hell, I don't want anyone to perish, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely, but then Calvinism says, but except you guys, you know, except this group that I haven't chosen, you, you know, I don't want you to be saved, because he's the one that made that choice. So how does that even make sense? And that's why... It's another reason why Calvinism is false. And, you know, the last one, the last one I find funny, uh, one contradiction I find within, within Calvinists is, is with soul winning. Because, you know, they do go soul winning because they're commanded to go soul winning, but yet they believe their soul winning makes no difference because the person's going to get saved whether or not they go soul winning or not. But then they go just go soul winning anyway. So they'll go soul winning with the urgency, but at the same time believing that what they do makes no difference. So... It's just interesting. Uh, I find these contradictions with Calvinism interesting. And, you know, as a Calvinist, instead of just accepting these views and saying, well, I don't know how to reconcile the two, you should just change and um, reject or maybe consider that Calvinism is a false doctrine. And the last thing on this point is just, well, they'll say, well, somebody might say, well, what about reprobates? You know, because re reprobates, they go to hell because of God you know, because God has rejected them. But see, the difference between Calvinism and reprobates is, see, Calvinism teaches that the person is reprobate from the get-go because they cannot even believe. They don't even have a choice to become reprobate. Whereas a reprobate in the Bible is somebody that has rejected God and God has now rejected them. It's just that that point in time has come before death. Because anybody that does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and comes to the point of death is now reprobate because they, they cannot, no matter what they do, go to heaven. It's just that with some people, that period, that, that point in time comes before death and they are made reprobate before they die. So rep being reprobate is different to Calvinism because they had a choice. God didn't choose beforehand uh, for them to reject him. 
So that's, that's the first position. First position is God is responsible for the person that goes to hell. And obviously that, I believe, is false. Now the second, the second um, scenario is it, it, the responsibility lies on a third party. And I think this is, uh, this is where there's a, a bit of a gray line between this one and the next one I'm going to, um, to mention. But the second scenario is the responsibility lies on a third party. And that third party, uh, number one, the first one I want to touch on here is, I'll just go to 2 Corinthians, because this is the only verse I could really think of. <coughs> and we'll just read a passage of scripture here. Is when it lies on a third party, it could be satanic or demonic, right? They'll say like, well, they couldn't believe. And the verse that really just sprang to mind when I thought of a satanic or a demonic reason why a person uh, cannot believe the gospel or can, did not hear the gospel, you think of that verse, in whom the God of this world hath blinded their eyes, mm. right? So we'll read through this passage and I'll just give you a, a couple of thoughts that I have. Reading from 2 Corinthians 3.12, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, which is talking about the old covenant, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So I just want you to know, the reason why I'm reading from, because the, the, the verse I mentioned that we're all thinking about is in 2 Corinthians 4. But the reason why I'm starting from 2 Corinthians 3 is because I think it actually has to do with it because they're all connected. We just have a chapter division there. I just want you to note there, verse 14, where it says, but their minds were blinded, right? For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So what they're saying here is when Moses came down from the mountain, remember his face was shining, he put a veil over it to cover the glory of that Old Covenant. But now that Old Covenant is, is abolished, but he's saying that that veil that was covering them from understanding the Old Testament is still there because they do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they read the Old Testament, that veil where they cannot steadfastly look on it is still there. And that's, that unbelief is what is blinding them, right? Because their, the minds were, their minds were blinded because the, when, the, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they turn to the Lord, that veil is then taken away. So one way I understand this is it's actually their unbelief. It's their lack of faith on Christ that is keeping that veil there. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. And now we get into chapter 4, uh, where we get into that. Therefore, so it is linked, because it's saying, because of what we just read in chapter 3, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. Now I'd say, you know, if, you, if a person takes the view that, it, it, that the responsibility of somebody not hearing the gospel or going to hell lies on a third party, and in this case we're talking about a satanic or demonic influence, one way you could take this verse is saying, well, it's the God of this world is blinding them from being able to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So the horse is, you know, they're being blinded by this God of this world, which is Satan, and therefore they cannot believe. But another way, you know, and, and this is some food for thought, I'm happy to discuss this with you guys as well, but you know, in chapter 3 when it was saying that, the, remember the veil covered Moses, and now the veil is still on their heart, even though um, the, the Old Testament has been abolished. But remember it said, if it turns to the Lord, that veil is going to be taken away. 
So I can understand from that that the responsibility is still on the person why they're being blinded. So it's not the, it's not the veil's fault that they can't see the old covenant. It's their unbelief is the reason why the veil is still there. And that's why it says their minds were blinded because the veil is covering them from understanding the Old Testament. So if we take that understanding and try and understand this verse, is it saying that the God of this world is blinding their mind and therefore they cannot believe? Or is it because they don't believe, where it says here, um, uh, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not? So is the God of this world only blinding their eyes because they don't believe? Like the veil in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So that's, that's another way you can understand it to say, you know, well, it's not the satanic influence that's responsible for them going to hell. But if they do not believe, that veil of the satanic influence is there and that's why they don't understand anything from the Bible. You know, like the, the, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So that's one, uh, one third party. It could be a satanic or demonic spirit. And, and I gave you the two, two views there. It could be, hey, it is satanic. You know, and then that way, that, that's what's causing them to go to hell. And you know, even me and Michael sometimes discuss, you know, is that why we have to pray to remove that satanic spirit so that they can believe? So that's one view. Or the other view is they have rejected the grace of God and that's why the God of this world is able to blind them from the truth the truths of God, God's world and not letting the light of that glorious gospel that otherwise would shine um, in their heart. Now the other third party, it could be a man, right? So let's uh, go to Ezekiel. <clears throat> Ezekiel 3, reading from verse 17, says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman, watchman unto the house of Israel, Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth, doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, I, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul, and the hand of the Lord uh, was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will talk with thee. So I would say this is probably the key verse, because you know I, I, I think I've, I've switched position, because this, this is probably was my position, but you know that's why I'm saying I don't think this is a definitive sermon, but there's two positions that I'm sort of rocking forward, back and forward between, but the next position I'm going to tell you is what I am swaying more towards. But the argument from this position would be, well, we see in Ezekiel that the watchman had a responsibility. And if the watchman did not warn the, the wicked person of the, the wrath of God, the judgment that was coming, the blood would be on him. Therefore, if we apply this principle to, the, to, to soul winning, if you don't tell that person that they're not going to be saved, hey, that you, that you have just caused them to go to hell. That's pretty much the reasoning. But let me show you here in Ezekiel. Uh, Because when it comes to a third party being the reason why somebody cannot hear the gospel or cannot believe on Jesus Christ or goes to hell, you know, how does it, how does that, how is that righteous, how is that just in light of, you know, this verse in Ezekiel where it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. You know, this principle that, you know, how, how is it, I mean, even in my own mind, how is it fair that another person goes to hell for the sin of another? Do you know what I mean? If that, if that person did not sin, but yet he's going to hell because somebody else sinned. And what do I mean by that? Is how is it fair if you, if you sin by not giving that person the gospel or not preaching the gospel to people, and that's the reason why they go to hell? Is that, is that, is that fair? 
I mean, in my own mind, like that that doesn't seem fair. That you know, I'm not going to just, just I'm not going to hell because of my own actions or my own rejection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to hell because somebody else did not warn me about Jesus Christ. They they didn't do that job. And I, you know, I know I've I've, I've seen this poem. It's it's a famous poem about the friend. I don't know if you've ever heard. It. I don't I don't have it on me. I'm just thinking about it right now. But it's a poem about you know I, I walked with you every day and never did you show me the way and. Basically, it's a friend writing this, like saying this from hell, saying, you know, you, you were my friend and you walked with me every day, but you never told me about Jesus Christ and now I'm in hell. Sort of that thought of, you know, it's, it's your fault that I'm in hell, not my fault. Not, I didn't reject Jesus Christ because you didn't tell me about him. But, but is that fair? That, because then, it, it, to me, it, it doesn't seem fair that, that they would go to hell because of that. And even when we look at uh, Ezekiel... Um, Three, you know, this is why we have to be careful when we get principles from the Old Testament because is it, does it only apply in an Old Covenant understanding? Can we, can we uh, rightly move it over to the New Covenant and still take that same principle, which is, is it the fault of the soul winner that the soul goes to hell for not telling him? Um, because remember, this is saying, this is talking about a physical judgment that's coming as well. That's the immediate context. A physical judgment that's about to come that is being warned of. But remember he says that if you warn him, you'll also deliver your own soul. Right? But is that, does that, how, is that how it works in the New Testament? No, because if you don't warn them, you're still saved. Right? You still believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't change anything. So is this, can this principle be directly applied to the New Testament understanding of winning souls and preaching, the, preaching Jesus and people um, being saved? Uh, I don't know. And this is sort of what make, makes me not take this position because you, you, this, is, would be, this would be the verse to say that it's the fault of the soul winner. Um, or you might say, you know, Romans 10, right? How shall they hear without a preacher? They need a preacher to be able to hear them. So I'm not saying that what we do doesn't make a difference because no doubt our actions make a difference, right? The Bible talks about, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? So somebody needs to, to tell them in order for them to believe what I'm getting at is, does it need to be you? Um, no doubt our efforts make a difference. So when we go out soul winning, it's not in vain. You know, we should always abound in the work of the Lord. It does make a difference. That's why Paul says, you know, I might uh, you know, become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So he, what he did made a difference. Um, you know, Jude says, you know, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So I'm not saying that our actions don't make a difference. But I'll, I'll explain what I think might be the right position. But like I said, I, I'm sort of swinging between these two. So we, we've talked about two scenarios so far. One is that God is responsible, and obviously you know, that, that is false. Number two is it's a third, a third party is responsible, meaning you know, either it's satanic or demonic, or you as the soul winner, you're responsible. You, and, and that's generally how it's preached you know, in the churches that we come from, is... You know, and, and I, I've probably preached it that way too. It's like, you know, if we, if we don't get the gospel to these people, then if they, they're not going to hear the gospel and they're going to die and go to hell. But I'm just thinking, is, is, that, is that fair for that person? You know, like, because let's say we, we just backslide, you know, this church backslides and we just cease to exist anymore. Is it our fault that everyone in this area goes to hell? I just, I, like, that's hard for me to accept that that is fair, that somebody will be able to stand before God and say, I am in hell, and you're, you've sent me to hell, but I did not get an opportunity to believe. And yet that person uh, is still justly sent to hell. So the third scenario would be that the responsibility stays on the sinner, which it is, it is their, their fault for not accepting the grace of God. But for me, in order for that to be fair, they need the opportunity to hear the gospel. So... To me, the, the, the logical conclusion is then somehow God has to get the gospel to everybody. Because if that was just up to us and we're sinful, we're not perfect, right? We, we know that there are opportunities that we have to give the gospel and we don't, right? So that means that somehow in the background, God is using us and using the believers to get the gospel to everyone. And, and that's just something that we would have to accept by faith in order for God to be just. In order for God to rightly send somebody to hell, 
for not believing the gospel. They must have had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Or we can say that God knew that even if they heard the gospel, they would not believe. But there must be that, that, that element there that, um, that they can be held accountable because they would reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'll show you a couple of verses that would support that view. Uh, Romans 1. Because there are verses in the Bible that talk about the gospel or the word of God going out into all the world. Look at here in Romans 1.8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So that can be one point in time where hey, did, we can say, hey, it did go everywhere. Otherwise, how can Paul rightly say that everyone throughout the whole world is speaking of your faith? And that's the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Colossians 1:21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So again, here we see that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. Uh, let me show you another one. Just a couple of other examples. Yeah, oh, I got a typo there. First Kings 10.1. And, and I, this is just an example where I, I just wanted to show that, you know, word spreads even in, 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 in the old times there. It says, And when the queen of Sheba had heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. So even back in the time of Solomon and the queen of Sheba, word is spreading about the name of the Lord to the point where the queen of Sheba hears about it and then she wants to go and find more, find out more. Um, And this really, I think, you know, it's funny that this chapter is the one where we say, well, you know, how should I hear without a preacher? You need to be that preacher. But look at what this, uh, this chapter actually says. I'll show you. Um, we'll just start from uh, verse 13. Sorry, it's not me being slow. It's just the computer. All right. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Right? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So that's what we're familiar with, with right? And we'll say, you know, that's why we've got to get the gospel out there. The, the, our feet are beautiful. If we go and preach the gospel to them, they're not going to hear unless we go and preach it to them. But let's read on. Look at this. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for as I say, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But look at this. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So what is he saying here? He's saying, you know, yeah, how shall they hear without a preacher? But then he says, but have they, haven't they heard? Verily their sound went out to all the earth and unto the ends of the world. And he's saying here at the end, he's saying Isaiah is very bold. I was found of them that sought me not. So it's like the Gentiles weren't even looking for me and I sent the word to them. And then he's saying here to Israel, and all day long I'm preaching the word to them and they, they reject me. So, you know, even the, the chapter that is probably what we think about, that a preacher needs to be there in order to hear the gospel, and I'm not discounting that truth, I'll explain it in a second, is saying that God somehow gets the word out to everybody. And he gets the word out to the Gentiles and he gets the word out to, to Israel. Um, 
He's getting the word out there. And the verse, I guess, that I think of, you know, because think about when we think of uh, bad things that happen in our life and choices that we make, we think of Romans 8, 28, right? We, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And, and we recognize, hey, even though we have a free will, we can make right and wrong choices. God ultimately, in his, I guess we want to call it sovereignty, right? Or whatever, he can ultimately take all our free will decisions and, and work them for good. And I think of the gospel getting out there the same way. You know, even though we're not always obedient, we don't go soul winning as much as we do, God still somehow uses what we do do and he makes sure the gospel gets to everybody so that everybody gets a chance to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what are the implications of this view? Well, the implications of this view is, does that remove the urgency of soul winning? Does it? Well, it does maybe for you, right? Because that does mean that if you don't get the gospel to that person, somebody else will. So the, the, the urgency, so the impl this is why there's, there's, there's implications here. And this is why for me it was a bit uncomfortable to first accept because I've, I, I guess we've grown up in the face just thinking like, you are responsible, you get the gospel out there. And I mean, that's good to, to encourage you to go out to get, get the gospel out there. But then it doesn't mean we have to, we, we should ignore the truths that we read in the Bible and ignore the logic and the, the justice of the punishment fitting the crime. So the implication would be, does that change the urgency of the gospel? Well, possibly for the soul winner, meaning maybe it's not a case of if you don't get that person to the gospel, they may never hear and they'll go to hell. It could just be a case of more so, um, well, if you want to be part of the work and if you want to be rewarded, you have an opportunity to work in the Lord's vineyard. And if you don't, you miss out. Maybe that, from the soul winner's perspective, is uh, the position that it is. It's like, hey, well, we have soul winning today. If you don't go, if you're not a part of the soul winning in this church, hey, you're just going to miss out on the rewards and the, and the extra inheritance that you can get when we go into the promised land, right? But maybe it's not, you know, well, if you don't give that person the gospel, then you're, it's your fault that they went to hell, because to me, that, that's not fair. But does that change the urgency of the person, the, the unsaved person, to get saved today? No. It doesn't matter who's telling them, right? They still need to get... Today is still the day of salvation. If they're not a believer, they need to get saved before they die and go to hell. So the urgency doesn't change for the, the, for the unsaved person. And when you're compelling them, the urgency doesn't change. You still want to be, it to be urgent for them. All I'm saying is that if, if you sin and you don't give the gospel to that person, does that mean that that person is without hope? I guess I believe for, for it to be fair and righteous according to God, somebody will get that gospel to them. They'll, they will hear somehow and they will have ample opportunity to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so I guess that does sort of change maybe that perspective. But I don't, yeah, I guess, you know, we've always been encouraged to go soul winning to, to, to think about those that don't hear. But maybe the encouragement should just be, hey, do you love God? Do you want to obey him? Do you want to be part? Do you want to be part of the work that God is doing um, or not? So does it remove the urgency of soul winning? I guess somewhat yes, maybe for you only. God's, God's will has not changed. He still wants everyone to be saved. Um, and we can still understand that verse where it says, how shall they hear without a preacher? Because somebody is still required to preach it to them. It's just the question is, is there only one person? It's kind of like with marriage, right? Is there just one person that God has planned for you? Is there just one person that is going to preach the gospel to that person? And if that person doesn't, then they just, you know, it's like married people. It's like if you don't meet that one person that God has planned for you, then you've missed, you've missed God's will. You, 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 you've not gone according to God's plan. So it's, is it like that with soul winning, where it's like if you don't give the gospel to that person, then that, there's no hope for that person because you were the person appointed. And if you don't do it, then that person's damned to hell. Or is it... Anybody can give that person the God. Who wants to reap that reward? You know, who want, who, there are souls out there ready to hear the gospel and ready to get saved. Who wants it? What, is that the mindset? Who wants to claim that prize? Who's going to go into the promised land? Or who's, you know, is, is that the mindset that we go with soul winning? Not, oh man, I better go, otherwise somebody's going to go to hell. Or is it, I better go because I want to be part of this work. So yeah, it will, it'll change that view. So um, that's why there's, there's implications with, with, with what position you take. It'll change what motivates you to go and, and, and your responsibility as the soul winner. Um, 
So our actions definitely make a difference. I'm not saying that because obviously they do. Because if our actions didn't make a difference, why would God reward us? Do you know what I mean? Like if, if you're going out and preaching the gospel to somebody and then getting saved, and, and they would have got saved anyway, like a Calvinist, why would God reward you for that work? So it does make a difference. You, you, you reap that harvest. I guess it's kind of like a vineyard, right? There are fruit there to be picked. And who wants to go and pick them? The more fruit you can go get, the more you're going to get rewarded. Um, but th that's why. The question remains, but I, am I the person's only opportunity? Or do they get other opportunities besides me? Even if I disobey God and sin, will I send that person to hell? Another thought as well is, you know, God promises that if we seek, we, we shall find him. So if somebody, you know, there, there won't be somebody that's seeking the truth that won't find it. You know, God, God promises that if somebody seeks after him, they will find it. <clears throat> and, you know, God, God will do what is just and right. So somebody might say, but, you know, but there are people who die never hearing about Jesus. You know, I mean, yes, possibly, but we, we really don't know. Like I said in the beginning, you know, is it, is it that they did hear the gospel and we're just assuming that they've never heard? Or is it that God knows that they would not believe even if they did hear? And that's why he doesn't bother to get a preacher to them. You know, God knows uh, obviously more than us. So I believe, I swing towards that position. I swing towards, you know, having the mindset of going out and preaching the gospel is going to claim rewards. And, you know, if, if I sin, if I backslide, will somebody, somebody else, I believe, will get it to them. They, they will have an opportunity here. Their salvation is not dependent on my righteousness, if that makes sense. And you might say, well, isn't that the same as Calvinism, right? That God is going to get somebody to them anyway. No, it's not, because Calvinism is God decides whether or not they can even believe, right? If they heard the gospel, they, they can't even believe. This is saying that God just makes sure everybody gets an opportunity. Everybody gets an opportunity, and then it's their choice whether or not to believe or not. And, but we can still hold them accountable because they've made that choice. They have willfully rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not like Calvinism. You know, but God, like, like we said in Romans 8.28, God can work situations to make sure that a willing preacher gets the gospel to people who will believe. And if, you, if you're not willing, you'll just lose the blessing and somebody else will get it. So two other questions I just want to end on. So those are the three positions, and I, and I would swing to the last one, obviously, that um, you know, I think it's more just and fair, more, a more encompassing answer that God gets the gospel to everybody. Um, but you know, for, for some people that want to um, say some other accusations to God, they might say, well, if God knew I would not believe, why did he even create me? You know, like if God, if God knows everything and he knew that I would not believe, why would he even create me? And again, this is an accusation against God, just saying that it's God's fault. You know, it's your fault that I'm going to hell because you knew I wouldn't believe and yet you created me anyway. But you know, that, that, that doesn't matter because that's not why God created them. You know, in the beginning, God created man to bless him and have dominion over him. You know, David says, you know, what, art, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Thou hast made him, you know, given him dominion over all your works. So, no, God did not create man to condemn him to hell. God created man in order to bless him and to be with him. That, that's just trying to shift the responsibility. You can see the question. They're trying to shift the responsibility of not believing on Jesus Christ to God. But they, they, they can just accept the Lord Jesus Christ and then they'll go to heaven. And then they don't need to have this accusation. So God did not create man to curse him. God created man to bless him. Um, but, you know, Calvinism would say otherwise. Because Calvinism says God did create them to curse them. Because God created them, they could not believe, and he just created them to curse them. So in Calvinism, you could hold that accusation to God and say, God, why did you even create me if I couldn't even believe? <clears throat> and then somebody said, was, might just say, oh yeah, then God shouldn't have created me, right? Because he, he knew I couldn't believe. But, you know, like I said, if just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's not like you have to work for it. You just need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. Amen. You know, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to turn from your sin. You don't have to give your life to Jesus. All you have to do is just accept the free gift that he's already paid. Just accept it. You know, if you just accept it, then you don't have to throw these accusations to God. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved forever. And if you really wanted to, you know, uh, I guess take advantage of the grace of God, you could continue in sin that grace would abound. But God forbid you would do that, um, that you would get right with God and, and that you would share the gospel with others. But even if you didn't, 
you would still be saved. There's no reason why uh, somebody would not have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because it, it is a free gift. It is only conditional upon you accepting it. Because obviously you have to believe that it's there in order to even accept it, right? It's by faith. Anyways, I hope that gives you some food for thought. I've been thinking about this for a while because, like I said, I was swinging between those last two positions. I think I'm sort of more firmly placed in the last position for the reasons that I've given you today. But um, if you have any questions or if uh, you want to talk about it afterwards, happy to chat with you about it. So I hope that was interesting for you. All right, let's pray and then we'll get ready for lunch.